The Affordable Care Act is uh, clearly one of the largest pieces of legislation and obviously one of the most controversial for all health care. Despite all that controversy, there, it is safe to say there's no illness that's going to be more affected than substance use disorders. I'll give you a few reasons why. First of all, in our field, substance use disorders have never been covered as a, uh, an illness at all. Only the most severe and chronic have ever received any kind of insurance reimbursement. That is, the addicted. Well, there are about 23 million addicted adults in the United States, which is a lot. But there are about 40 to 45 million others who drink too much, use substances too often. That, that substance use compromises the diagnosis, care, course, management costs of virtually every uh, illness. There have never been insurance benefits for them. Now there are. Moreover, it's not just a specialty anymore. It's part of regular, general, uh, primary care medicine. Likely, many of the things that are going on in the rest of uh, chronic care management, the, the chronic care model, for example, uh, will apply to the treatment probably not of the most serious addictions, but to many of the lower severity um, uh, substance use problems. So basically, there's a market now for the kinds of care and services that we've always wanted to provide but never been able to. Substance use disorders encompass a range of problems with the use of alcohol, cigarettes, uh, licit drugs used against medical advice, and illicit substances. And by the way, new substances are arriving all the time, designer drugs. Okay. The full term is substance use disorders. As you go from use to medically harmful use to abuse to frank addiction, um, you go up in terms of severity, uh, chronicity, complexity. What's important is most people don't realize that. They think there's only one kind of a substance use disorder, and that's addiction. And it has extremely important perceptual effects. People who drink way too much for their relationships to be good at work, to uh, function um, appropriately, do not imagine that they have a substance use disorder because in their mind, the only people that do are people that are falling down drunks or people who are in, have, have shakes. Uh, withdrawal symptoms. So as we move toward coverage and understanding of the full uh, syndrome, it's going to be very important for public understanding and it's going to be very important for, for medical understanding. That's one of the reasons why so many cases of substance use disorders are ignored by the medical establishment. They've not had uh, training in recognizing uh, the full range. They think they know about substance use disorders when in fact they only know a little bit about the most severely affected. In my view, uh, the way to think about treating uh, serious substance use disorders is to think about how you would treat and manage another chronic illness. Let's take diabetes. I think it's a very apt um, analogous condition. Like most substance use disorders, most uh, adult onset uh, cases of diabetes are acquired disorders. You eat your way into uh, diabetes. You can't cure diabetes in its most severe form, but you can manage it and people can live a full, rich life with, with low levels of symptoms and high levels of function. One of the things that makes uh, the management of diabetes better is work now to, to recognize pre-diabetes. Early signs, the kinds of people who are most likely to get it because of genetics or because of personal health habits, personal lifestyle habits, and provide early interventions. So with that as background, the kinds of care that is now available for, for people who, have, who are, let's say, addicted physicians or addicted airline pilots is a very good model. 
but the kind of care that ought to be available for everyone. Early diagnosis uh, to prevent and, and intervene early in cases where there's emerging problems is going to be by far the most efficient. That kind of care ought to be available in primary care settings, schools, any place uh, where that, that's going to be. Certainly schools and colleges uh, should have that kind of care. Okay, you won't be able to prevent or intervene effectively with everyone. As a case uh, gets worse in terms of severity, chronicity, complexity, now it seems to me you're going to need stages of care. One stage would be stabilization. Get rid of the kinds of uh, chemical toxins, physiologic and, and emotional uh, instability that so often occurs associated with really serious substance use, which is a very good but not sufficient uh, amount of care. It's designed to prepare you for the next phase, which is uh, clinical management. N nobody knows exactly, like diabetes, nobody knows exactly which combination of behavioral therapies, um, medications, uh, interventions, social services, family training thing are going to be exactly right. So that's going to take judgment and uh, concerted effort. But with the help of clinical management, you ought to see first elimination of the substance use, and you ought to see return of function or emergence of, of function and um, a prevention of relapse. At some point, nobody knows when just yet, but at some point, the management of that care has to be transferred over to the patient. The end goal of all chronic illness management is patient self-management. We can't cure these illnesses, but properly educated, properly motivated, properly instructed patients with sufficient social and medical resources available to them ought to be able to continue to manage their illness. Of course that's true in addiction. The role of AA and other peer support networks has been a, a really terrific uh, way of doing that. Um, that kind of staged model, I think, is going to be the way most cases of, of substance use disorders are treated by a general medical system. You don't have to choose. You can do both of them. And that's an interesting point. The kinds of people that can manage diabetes, hypertension, asthma, other chronic illness, they ought to be able, with a little bit of training, they ought to develop a parallel effort to concurrently manage substance use disorders, eating disorders, um, and most mental health disorders. you gotta, you got to treat it all. Otherwise, you, you, you're just going to have rapid recycling of, into the hospital and double-digit uh, increases in health care costs. In its essence, the Affordable Care Act is a new way of financing and purchasing uh, health care. And it might be seen as simply uh, just that, and of course it's debated. But I think it's way more in the case of addiction. Think about the, the decisions that have been made in this country about how to purchase substance use disorder care. In the interest of husbanding scarce resources, the decision was made long ago to just treat patients with the most severe complex chronic disorders, the truly addicted. It sounds like a pretty good idea. It would restrict dollars and, and, and that, that may be a good thing. I think history is going to show that it was a terrible idea because it's produced market forces that um, go against quality and uh, continuity and it has distorted both medical and public understanding about the nature of the illness. I think it's best seen if you think about the same kind of healthcare purchasing strategy applied to an illness, let's say diabetes. Um, suppose we said, we're spending too much money on diabetes treatment. Why don't we restrict that to just people with real diabetes? People, for example, who have lost their fingers or toes or had a diabetic coma or got retinopathy. That 
on the surface might be good. We'd stop having to give all that care to people who have lower severity problems. But think about it. First, that would eliminate the market for pre-diabetic care, nutrition, management, uh, all the kind of health things that are so common now. There'd be no market for it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. And then it wouldn't be taught, okay? But more than that, it would change how people saw it. Very soon, the face of diabetes would be horribly obese, probably poor, uh, uh, treatment resistant, uh, individuals who had many warnings along the way to, you know, change your diet, exercise more, don't do this, uh, all that stuff, and for whom uh, uh, treatment did not have a very good prognosis. Very soon, healthcare professionals would say, gee, that's not the kind of population I'm interested in. Remember something else. Healthcare purchasing decisions largely come from employers. So as you begin to narrow the group to the most severe, the most complex, the most chronic, you eliminate the number of people who are likely to be employed or employed in high-level positions. So as funding decisions, insurance reimbursement decisions came down, what group do you think would be cut the, the first? Um, very soon, the public would begin to see diabetes as just those people with the most severe form. People who have lower level would say to all their families, see, I'm not that bad, I don't have diabetes, I don't look like anything like those people that really have it. And that would perpetuate denial. And doctors would soon real the only time they would see a, a, what they thought was a, a, a diabetic patient was in an emergency room setting probably, or in some very uh, strained setting. They would come out, thinking they understood the disorder of diabetes, but forevermore in their practices, they would miss and not even really understand the need to screen for people with early uh, subs uh, diabetic, uh, pre-diabetes disorders. So, yes, it's sort of a forced uh, picture, but I think it illustrates how purchasing decisions can have really profound effects on public understanding, medical understanding, the availability of, of care. Factors that, that are important in every other market for improving quality and improving access. So with that, I see the Affordable Care Act as opening a, a very uh, wide door to new markets and new forces for quality in our view.